Boy, what a journey this has been so far. When I decided to take a look through the Asylum's catalog, I had no idea what I'd be sitting through, or the phases the studio would go through to find identity. Starting this retrospective, I thought I'd just have to get through a couple monster movies and mediocre dramas before finally tackling the mockbusters and crazy creature features the studio churns out to this day. And boy, did that not happen. After a false start, including reviewing titles the Asylum technically had nothing to do with, I got to dig into the Asylum's true history. The actual films that started the studio, the people behind them, and newcomers who would become power players in producing the content we see today. I've had to put more effort into researching and writing about these movies than I thought they'd need. Or deserve. Even compiling a chronological list of what they themselves produced took multiple sources and compromises. And even now, I'm pretty sure I missed a few titles. But here we are, one year and 27 movies after I announced I'd be taking a chronological look at the Asylum and their output, and I can definitely say I'm a different person than when I first started. 30 pounds heavier, if nothing else. But I do think that, by this point, I've compiled a more comprehensive history about the early days of the studio and its movies than most others currently available. At the very least, I know Belly Fruit was not the Asylum's first production, no matter what Wikipedia will tell you. This retrospective really did open my eyes to the various people behind the scenes, and the many peaks and valleys the Asylum went through to become the B-movie kings we know them as today. Is the look as bad as I thought it was gonna be? Well, in a couple ways it's worse, but I can also say I'm surprised and even entertained by what early Asylum was behind. Whether they were so bad they were good, so bad they were... really bad, or they were legitimately good, surpassing the standards expected from a studio of this reputation, I can confirm that the Asylum, even in its early years, was not boring. Even if a good chunk of their releases were. We're about to enter the next era of the Asylum, the mockbuster age that everyone knows and love hates them for. It also means a step up in production quality, more familiar faces, and fewer Z-grade releases that, even for a studio that would seemingly release anything, were embarrassing. Oh, we'll still be covering some stinkers, some bottom-of-the-barrel blocked-up toilet sludge titles that will make both you and me question what had to happen for life to lead to these decisions. But they'll look a little nicer. However, before we say goodbye to this era of struggle and experimentation, I think we should properly cap it off with one last look back at this age of the Asylum. Namely, let's remind ourselves of the absolute worst dreck they offered during these dark years, and pray to every cosmic force that will never see their kind again. These are, in my humble opinion, the top 10 worst movies from the Asylum's early days. Or top 10 worst classic Asylum movies, for sure. The only ground rule I'm setting is that the movie had to have been actually produced by the Asylum. In the beginning, on top of their in-house productions, the studio also served to distribute dozens of independent films from other studios and producers. Most of which we likely won't take a look at, since I want to focus on what the Asylum themselves worked on. These other titles are probably notably good or notably bad, but I get the impression the Asylum was less focused on that little detail than they were making sure that they were written to disc and sitting comfortably on the shelves at Hollywood Video. Their own movies? They don't have that excuse. They knew perfectly well what they were making, so if the movie is crap of the lowest caliber, it's their own fault. That's why for this list, I'm going to be focusing exclusively on movies produced by a major name connected to the Asylum. So Belly Fruit, Foreplay, and Vampires vs. Zombies are all out. As well as Max Knight Ultra Spy. Even though it was conceived and written by the Asylum Studio heads, they had nothing to do with the actual production, so the finished product is not their doing. Besides that, anything from any director is fair game. As long as it has Lateral Romawi attached as producer, there will be a spot here waiting for it. One final note, I don't think I'll be following this up with the top 10 best classic Asylum movies list. I don't even think I could come up with the top five. Yes, The Asylum has produced some fun bad movies, but in terms of movies I'd actually recommend, I think there's only one or two that fit that qualifier. I guess I could make a top five most enjoyable classic Asylum movies list, but that sounds too subjective. Plus, you're all probably chomping at the bit, foaming at the mouth for me to finally get to the movies you're actually curious about, and ready to lynch me for putting this first and making you have to wait again. So it's probably wise for me to get this over with so we can finally get to talking about the Asylum as we know it. With that said, let's finish up our look at pre-Mockbuster Asylum. And for anyone just joining us, consider this video a jumping on point. So without further ado, these are the Top 10 Worst Classic Asylum Movies. <laughs> Number 1. 
Number 10. Jane White is Sick and Twisted. Some may be surprised that this one is on the list. Well, everyone else is just going, what's Jane White is Sick and Twisted? On the one hand, I do feel guilty to have to list this as one of the worst movies I've seen from the Asylum, especially since this was one of David Michael Latt's pep projects, and it's easily one of the best looking of the Asylum's productions. But in the end, I have to list it here for one simple reason. It's not funny. Oh sure, it has an all-star cast, each actor clearly giving the same amount of effort they put into the characters that made them famous. But it's not funny. Sure, it looks great, with a lot of hard work put into the variety of visual styles that add to the theme of the movie. But it's not funny. Sure, its surrealist nature is interesting, incorporating elements from other movies and shows that call into question how much of this is actually happening and what's all in the mind of the title character, and it could very well be used as the subject of many film essays and psychological theses to deconstruct said themes and create a mind map of Jane White and the writers and actors in general. But it's not funny. And for a movie advertising itself as a comedy, that's the greatest sin it could commit. Because if you're not laughing, then, well, what's the point? There are gags, there are puns, there is a lot of absurdity stemming from its surreal nature, but nothing is actually developed. The jokes start, but they don't go anywhere, and a lot of them are reliant on knowing what they're referencing, or they just pass the reference itself off as a joke. Much like a Seltzerberg comedy, except somehow even lazier with the execution. Now most of the humor isn't terrible, there are a couple moments that are hard to sit through and get particularly embarrassing, but they don't ruin the rest of your day. They just tell a bad joke, then move on to the next one. It doesn't leave you feeling dirty, because it doesn't leave you with anything at all. Nothing's around long enough to stick, which is both its blessing and its curse. And besides being generally unfunny, it's also very boring. Scenes will stretch far past the point of audience interest, just going on and on, reiterating the same points over and over again ad nauseum. The opening gag, I guess we could call it, goes on for over 20 minutes, nearly a quarter of the runtime. Which, if it was funny, if it kept the humor going, might be forgivable, but it's not. Besides one or two jokes, the energy given off by the cast, and an out of nowhere stop motion musical number, the movie's just unremarkable. Not spending enough time developing its world or unique sense of humor, and squandering the potential a setup like this could have. I feel sorry that this movie didn't do well, as it was clearly meant to be a launching platform for the people who worked on it. But as a comedy, it's just not funny, and as a movie, it's as dull as a dish of dried dandelions. It says something when I've laughed harder at Asylum movies not intended to be comedies. If you want to see this movie done right, go watch Weird Al's UHF, or even Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. This movie isn't sick or twisted, nor is it worth your time to seek out. Number 9. Evil Eyes. It was a close call between Evil Eyes and Killers 2 which one would get a spot on this list. They're both bad psychological horror movies, but in the end the dubious honor of being on this list ultimately goes to Evil Eyes. Why? Because I have no idea what's going on! The story is that there's this writer trying to create a screenplay for a mysterious movie producer, but everything he writes seems to happen in real life. Now that's a fascinating idea, and one that's been used to great effect in other movies, so there's no reason why it couldn't work here too. Except I don't think the movie itself knows what it wants to do. For one thing, the cause-effect isn't clear. Sometimes what he writes happens in real life, and sometimes it doesn't. I think, the movie doesn't exactly clue us in on what he's typing on that laptop most of the time, and the only time we see something happen is when he writes in a death or injury. And no, it's never let on if Jeff thinks that his writing is causing these things to happen. He never experiments with it, doesn't type something and then waits to see what happens, nor does he try to make something good out of it. If I had a magic word processor that could make literally anything happen, I'd be living on my own planet. Sipping coladas with the literal Marvel Avengers team as I bench press Godzilla with my 350 pounds of raw muscle to impress my beautiful reptilian cat wife. Not the case with Jeff, who writes stuff, has stuff happen to his friends, then he goes, hmm, that was weird, and continues to write his screenplay of death. All while showing no emotion or reaction to his situation, because Adam Baldwin isn't as invested in this character as the audience is. And to make it even harder to figure out what's going on, the movie chaotically juggles themes and plot lines like the boss from Harvey Birdman. 
because apparently the producer is the literal devil and he's intentionally driving Jeff insane. And there's evidence that this happened years ago, the last time someone was commissioned to write this script. And there's this thing about Jeff being blacklisted from writing and his agent is a sleaze. And there's another script everyone's climbing over themselves to write. And Jeff's wife is pregnant, but she might also be having an affair. And there's more baseball scenes and the room has football. And no, 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 no. Uh -uh, I'm sorry. No, you can't even write one plot competently. You have no reason trying to fill your movie with more sub plots than a Mass Effect game. And all of this is topped off with some of the worst editing and camera work I've ever seen in a movie. There's no sense of progression. Most scenes could have been spliced in anywhere and would fit just as well. And many don't last more than a minute. Heck, some don't even last 10 seconds. We're here, then we're there, 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 there, and absolutely none of this answers any of my questions or provides more insight into Jeff, his writing, or the mystery behind the screenplay. And throughout this scene puree, the camera insists on remaining 12 inches away from the actors' faces, sometimes venturing as close as 2 inches to give us a good look of every pore on the actor's nose. It's a movie that insists on showing everything, and none of it is important. So why is this movie so low on the list? Well, the movie's bad, but it's at least an interesting bad. Things did happen, there were elements of intelligent writing scattered throughout, so it wasn't just another cookie-cutter horror movie. It was a movie that made me think, where I tried to piece together what the movie was about, what themes it was trying to incorporate, and how it could have been better, resulting in probably my most insightful review, and one of my favorites. On top of that, Udo Kier brings a mesmerizingly good performance, there's some attempt at chemistry between the actors, the camera journey at the beginning is impressive, and how often DreamWorks is just brought up in casual conversation is unintentionally funny. Like, how desperate and insecure do you have to be to get a studio's attention that you praise them in your script like they're the bringers forth of a new golden age of cinema? And to think studios usually have to pay for that kind of promotion. And then, of course, there's the twist ending. The last 10 minutes that answer maybe one or two questions, but then present a dozen more. Now, I didn't spoil the ending in the actual review, but if you're here, that probably means you've seen the review and then you've either seen the movie since then or you don't care enough to, so I'll go ahead and reveal it here. But if you do want to see the movie unspoiled, skip to the timecode on screen. We good? Okay. Jeff's wife Tree was the actual killer all this time. Yes. Really. Whenever Jeff wrote something in his script relating to a friend being maimed or dying, she'd go out and make that exact same thing happen to them. How? Because she has magic powers. Yeah. She just makes things happen, makes things break, makes things float, sometimes get a guy in just the right position to get drilled through the eye. It's just something she can do. Why is she doing all this? How does she have these powers? Never explained. We don't know what her role in all of this is, just that she has some connection to the demonic producer that is never elaborated on. Oh, and to top it all off, she's the child of the last guy who worked on the film, who also allegedly killed his family then himself. Why that was necessary to point out, I have no idea. Just that Jeff tries to kill her and the curse, she uses her spooky mind magic to try to kill him, but he does finally kill her, then himself. But so MG, your child survives, and 35 years later, the whole thing starts all over again. <laughs> It's a complete tonal shift, one that I never saw coming, because it doesn't match the rest of the movie at all. It's so bizarre and tacked on, it almost makes the experience worth it. I'd say just watch the ending, but that would require watching the rest of the movie for context. And no, even with that ending, it's just not worth it. You tried, Evil Eyes. I can tell that you tried. But in the end, the only Evil Eyes here are the ones your viewers are giving you for wasting their time and money. Number 8. Scarecrow Slayer Again, it was a close running between Scarecrow Slayer and Shapeshifter. Both are incredibly boring monster movies, but ultimately Scarecrow Slayer won out. Because it has no reason to be boring. The first Scarecrow movie is one of my favorite Asylum productions, as well as slasher movies in general. It's a cheesy movie, stuffed to the brim with corn, one that knows it doesn't have the best equipment or the most experienced cast and crew, so they just have fun with what they have. The deaths are creative, the practical effects are pretty good, the acting from everyone is over the top, and the main slasher is a feed bag of fun. 
He's athletic, he's goofy, he comes up with some funny zingers and creative kills, and he loves what he's doing, even if we don't always know why he's doing it. Sure, he's a blatant Freddy Krueger ripoff, but what's wrong with a good Freddy impression? Yes, the editing is pretty bad, the movie drags a point, especially during the opening credits, our supposed leading lady disappears for the majority of the runtime, and we get two endings, for some reason. But it's fun, has a good soundtrack, and clearly had a lot of love and effort put into it. Even if it's not a good movie, it's one that I highly recommend. Scarecrow Slayer, on the other hand, is one of the most stock horror movies I've seen in recent memory, even compared to other Asylum releases. It's a movie that has no business being a sequel to Scarecrow. Different cast, different crew, different writers, and none of the fun or creativity of the first film. The only thing these movies share besides a title is that it's the same performer in the same Scarecrow costume. But even then, it's obviously a different monster. Gone are the cheesy one-liners or the revenge motivation. It's just some guy who gets turned into your typical mute stalker monster and who also wants to turn this girl into a scarecrow for some reason. And that's the movie. The girl running from place to place, the scarecrow right behind her, killing anyone in his way. And then some. And that's when it bothers to show up. There are long periods where the scarecrow is absent, which, yeah, the first movie had as well. But instead of talking about the scarecrow or building up for when he strikes again, the characters here just whine and dither until the movie says he can come back for a sec. And none of these cookie cutter slasher movie victims make watching these scenes any better. Everyone's boring, everyone's an idiot, getting killed was the best thing that ever happened to them. The only guy with any personality is the sheriff, who is shown cheating on his pregnant wife before the movie decides he's suddenly a good guy right before he gets chopped in half. Even a regular scarecrow wouldn't be as lifeless as these wastes of skin. Oh, but then the terrible digital effects come in to make the movie even harder to watch. From horrible green screening, to obviously superimposed night skies, to ugly purple filters and stock lighting effects covering the screen, it would have been more convincing if they hired the local second grade to make the backgrounds out of cardboard. But it all pales in comparison to one of the biggest technical goofs of all time, where they actually forgot to animate the actress falling which has become sort of a running gag for this channel. Hmm, top 10 worst effects from the Asylum. That's a consideration. And to top everything off, the absolute letdown of an end movie battle. Not only is it covered in a filter so deep purple that deep purple should sue, it's obvious only one stuntman had any training. So the battle is comprised entirely of the original Scarecrow doing flips and kicks while the other swings a stick around and is eventually thrown into a wood chipper. All the suspense and excitement as Scorpion versus a nine-year-old with leukemia. And somehow I'd feel less dirty watching that fight. Looking back, I will admit that the kill scenes aren't as bland and unimaginative as I originally called them, especially compared to some of the other monster movies I've had to watch, and I forgot to mention that David Michael Latch is in the director's chair, so even if he doesn't direct the characters as well as Emmanuel Eiter did, he does know where to point a camera. But yeah, even adding the return of Todd Rex and his awesome backflips, that's far from enough to save this movie. I've seen some bad sequels to horror movies, and this one is not one of the worst, I can't be that cruel. But it's still bad, and it pales in comparison to how fun the original Scarecrow movie is. And I know there's a third one out there, but it doesn't have the original Scarecrow actor or costume, so do I really have to see it? Probably not. If you ever see a DVD of this movie lying around and wonder what to do with it, what else can I say but stuff it. Number 7. Intermedio. While I had a hard time filling out the first three slots for this list, the rest of these titles practically placed themselves. There is no doubt that these are some of the worst movies, god I don't even just want to say from the asylum, just any studio in general. Anyone who would think any of these movies were a good idea should publicly flog themselves with a wet t-shirt as penance. And it starts with Intermedio, one of the messiest movies I've ever seen. Oh I know I just got done calling Evil Eyes horribly paced and edited, but at least those scenes look like they all belong to the same movie. This one? Not as much. From what I understand, the original script was about a crazy loner who kills anyone who uses his tunnels, using his pickaxe and crude homemade mechanical traps that shoot sharp hardware at the victim. And watching through the flick, you can tell that's definitely the direction they started in. But then at some point, they decided, eh, let's make it about ghosts instead, and spent the meager amount of time and money they had left downloading ghost stock effects and trying desperately to make a few new scenes match up with what they already filmed. 
The result is one of the sloppiest chop shop editing jobs ever shown on screen. Now we have very blurry choppy ghosts in dollar store skeleton costumes that throw chains at people, arms that emerge from walls, tickle their victims, and then just let them go, and people that are killed by… water, I guess. Water and the same ghost stock effects layered over and over again. And sometimes the water teleports people. Just something it can do, I guess. Oh, and don't forget the saw blade that cuts you in half but gives you back your crutches as you fall. And Steve Rails back, the guy supposed to be our villain, is left doing practically nothing. He just wanders around, sometimes carrying a pickaxe, sometimes carrying some mysterious blood vial, and never meeting up with our leads until the last quarter. He never even uses his pickaxe, even that job is given to the ghosts. And if he can just kill anyone anywhere with his magical tube, why doesn't he kill anyone anywhere with his magical tube? Not to mention this version cuts out any motivation, since right after telling the remaining leads his son was killed by drug dealers, we see he killed his son to get the blood thing. Which he also technically never uses, since it's clearly footage filmed later with a stand-in or overlaid over an earlier shot of Railsback. And no, none of this bears any consistency with anything we've seen before or will after. Oh my god, every YouTube poop I've ever seen has more coherent editing than this movie. At least X does something for 10 hours as consistent. I have no idea what choices had to happen to nonsensically morph this movie midway into something almost completely different, but god would I love to be a fly on that wall. Of course, even if the movie did stick with the original plot, I doubt it would have been any better. We'd still be stuck with these unlikable whiny tokens the movie tries to pass off as characters. We'd still have to endure the quarter-assed acting on display, well except for Edward Furlong who throws his entire ass into his fascinatingly uninterested performance. We'd still have to sit through the long periods of nothing happening as the people on camera do their best to convince you to hate them more and more. And editing duties would still likely go to David Michael Latt, who would throw annoying transition after annoying stock effect at the camera to further prove he should stick with directing and be allowed nowhere near the editor's table. In other words, if the movie wasn't so awkwardly edited with such a level of what the hell were they thinking on display, it would likely have ended up as yet another dime a dozen no budget slasher flick. And that's why, even though it's on this list, I kinda recommend checking this movie out. It's so painfully edited together, so obviously made from two different scripts, and is so lacking in sensor continuity, it's an almost worthwhile watch. Just to sit down and attempt to identify where one movie ends and another begins makes for a fascinating bad movie night. It's truly the monster of go-go of the 2000s, right down to its fluctuating tone and production values. But yeah, if you're looking for an unironically entertaining movie based on quality and not incompetence, then this isn't the movie for you. If you don't want a movie that's the equivalent of the Dragula car crashing into a Home Depot, then go ahead and flush this cagada right down El Inordoro. You'll be more contento you did. Number 6. Detour. You know those horror films you sometimes see characters in movies and TV watching? Flicks so stock and by the numbers they were clearly put in just so the characters of the actual movie have something to watch and laugh at? Yeah, that's this movie. Possibly the most unoriginal, routine, no frills slasher flick I've seen in my life. The plot is that a van full of teenagers get stranded in the middle of nowhere and are picked off one by one by a group of crazy cannibals. That's literally it. Every single cliché associated with that plot is here. The drugged up horny teenagers that talk solely in innuendo before their dialogue is replaced by incessant screaming. The crazy old man who warns the group not to go somewhere before being killed off by the monsters. The creepy kid holding something that keeps popping up with an instrumental sting. The whole, there's something out there, go check it out or you're not getting nookie exchange. It's all here, scene for scene, word for word, said and filmed with a completely straight face. The only changeup is that there's a white guy saying and doing what's usually reserved for the black guy in a pre-2010 slasher movie, and I'm convinced it's only because they couldn't find a black guy in time willing to degrade himself. I know I haven't given most of the Asylum's horror movies high marks for creativity or originality, but there was something. Some identity, some variation on the formula, some character or monster that stood out. Absolutely none of that is present here. This is a template, something meant to serve as a pre-built structure for actual writers to change and add to, somehow mistaken for a full screenplay. A demo, downloaded from the Unity store, then immediately uploaded to Steam for the fake developer to try to pass off as their own work, if you will. 
With the Mockbuster cover art and the title that was tacked on over a year and a half after completion in a desperate attempt to market this schlock, you'd be forgiven if you thought it shared similarities with the Wrong Turn movie. But that's just because Wrong Turn is also every horror movie ever. But while that one at least gave us some impressive inbred hillbilly makeup and some creative effects and competent camera work, this one... doesn't. I don't even know what else to say. There's literally nothing else to add on to that. I struggle to summarize this movie in the actual review, and even with a shorter synopsis, I have barely anything to work with. I guess Lawrence the Wigger is kind of fun for the first 30 minutes, and they have a giant hillbilly slasher with an inventive claw weapon they could have done a lot more with, but besides that, no, nothing. The only thing of note is that this is the final project of S. Lee Taylor, a longtime contributor to the Asylum even before there was an Asylum. And because he's proven to be a competent writer-director in the past, I'm almost convinced there was a falling out between him and the studio heads, and he just made this to fulfill a contractual obligation before leaving and never looking back. I have nothing to back this up, but it sounds like an infinitely more fascinating story than what this movie gave us. Unless you want to be bored out of your skull with the most predictive plotting, inane dialogue, and unimpressive kill scenes ever unironically put into a movie, then take a detour away from ever having to watch this unoriginal waste of film. Unfortunately, as we've seen, there are worse things than being unoriginal, hence why we're only halfway through this list. Strap yourselves in, people. Things are about to get really rough. Number 5. Legion of the Dead Hey, you wanna watch The Mummy? Remade in the director's hometown with whatever money he had in his wallet at the time? Yeah? Well, go watch that movie then, because you'll probably get more enjoyment out of it than whatever this thing is. This is one of the most, let's see, what's the best way to phrase this, strangely boring movies I think I've seen. As in, it shouldn't be boring, it's set up to be exciting, there are some decent effects and set work, a passable backstory for a slasher, and a crazy as all hell reason for there to be an Egyptian tomb in Southern California. And yet, I'm as invested in this movie as a kid told to eat their peas. Their three day old peas they still refuse to eat despite being told they're not getting dessert until they're gone. I think most of it can be attributed to just how involved our supposed lead characters are. Now the acting for most of the cast isn't bad, but they're given nothing to work with. There's stuff about the lead being in between boyfriends and her sister being a rebellious party girl and their college professor suddenly goes insane and then there's a sheriff duo looking into some murders that occurred earlier and I'm sorry, wasn't there supposed to be an Egyptian priestess killing people to amass her undead army to take over the world? Because if there was, nobody seems to acknowledge it. Everyone is off in their own little worlds, letting the priestess amass the army she needs completely unopposed. Hell, I think even she's bored by how easily she wins. Her expression throughout most of the movie makes an Easter Island statue look as flexible as Jim Carrey's face. And almost none of the people she kills have any relation to our supposed lead characters or even the setting. They're just random guards and drunk frat boys that wander off and get stalked lightning to death. While the people actually supposed to be fixing the situation are fighting over... I don't even remember it had so little to do with anything. Even the leads from Jolly Roger, all of whom don't even meet our main slasher until the last 10 minutes, were at least doing some research, trying to find out who was keel-hauling the town and why. Here? I think our lead honor student, Molly, does a little bit of digging at some points, but it's so drowned out by constant shots of annoying characters partying or our main monster looking bored, she could have discovered a cure for cancer, and I would still say nothing happens in this movie. Throw in how nearly every kill is the same, how poorly our guest stars are implemented, I mean, they don't even meet our main hero or villain, and that they introduce what could be an interesting plot, only to throw it away less than five minutes later, and you have one of the most uncreative executions of a creative idea you could imagine. But for me, the clincher is just how bad the dubbing is. And there is a lot of dubbing. They clearly didn't have outdoor sound equipment for most shots, so they just did some ADR work in post. And with the sonic boom that accompanies every switch from live dialogue to overdubbed audio, you'll notice every time. It gets especially bad near the end, where sound effects are clearly missing, the same sinister sounds overpower most of the rest of the audio, and they don't even bother to sync the later dub work up with the actor's lips. Or have the urgency of the dialogue match the level of energy on screen, so we'll have people gasping for air while doing a light jog. And the scariest part is, this isn't even the worst sound we get from an Asylum movie. We still have four movies to go, and, if you can believe it, it just gets worse from here. There's just nothing to this movie. 
It's nowhere near good, and yet, it's just the right level of competent to miss being memorably bad. If it was Vampires vs. Zombies level of acting and effects quality, I'd at least marvel in how backyard auteur the level of production was. But because there's effort in the sets, and the gore, and the actors' performances, and even the stock effects they use, I have to recognize that there was work and money put into it, and that they were capable of making something better than what we got. So, if we're fitting so perfectly into that niche of mediocrity where it's neither deserving of praise nor meaningful mockery, this is truly one of the most frustrating and underwhelming viewing experiences I've gotten from an Asylum production. If you've ever wanted a movie where being mummified alive and buried in carnivorous scare beetles is the better alternative, well, this isn't it. It's so mediocre, I can't even give it that distinction. Though I will keep this clip on hand. Where is my mummy? Yeah, expect to get tired of that gag in the near future. Number 4. Way of the Vampire Nobody wants to pay to see your Vampire the Masquerade LARP session. I'm sorry, but they don't. I don't care how much work you put into writing your campaign, please keep your videos to your small circle of friends and leave anyone who doesn't follow your tabletop adventure out of it. And especially don't give what was meant solely as a dialogue-heavy role-playing adventure a budget and try to pass it off as a movie. As this film clearly is. Okay, I don't know if this actually did start off as somebody's RPG. With the acting, pacing, and production values on display, I wouldn't be surprised if it did. This movie barely has a plot. Just your typical good versus evil, vampires versus humans battle, where the main bad guy did something to the main character's love interest, and he's sworn revenge on said bad guy and his legion of followers. It's about as 80s Apple II role-playing game as you can get. I think the kids in Stranger Things came up with more complex scenarios for their D&D adventures. But okay, a simple plot isn't a bad thing. Heck, in most cases, it's better to have a simple plot that anyone can follow than an overly complicated plot where too much is happening and wants to take in. Well, leave it to this movie to take the most straightforward setup in the history of storytelling and make it as hard to follow as the Lord of the Rings books, which themselves overcomplicate the simplest of plot elements. But unlike LOTR, this movie doesn't present a complex plot through creative histories or likable characters or developing the many lands and races of its unique world. No, it does it through incessant talking. I don't think there's a single scene where the movie shuts up. Every single character has to constantly be talking, continually delivering exposition, or just screaming while charging into a fight. And none of it is interesting, none of it serves to build this world, it's just the exact same points reiterated over and over again. I think both the lead hero and lead villain tell us their mission statements at least five times apiece. And when the characters are tired of telling us the plot for the 50th time, they'll go into the most basic of vampire facts and deliver them like they're earth-shaking revelations. Like we're not already familiar with basic vampire lore, from the billion movies we've seen since we were kids that featured vampires. And if the constant exposition doesn't already make you want to reenact the cover of Electric Larry Land, it's all delivered as flat and unnatural as possible. Absolutely nothing in this movie resembles human speech. People will introduce themselves like they're reading off their character sheets. And any romantic banter is like they took that love has blinded you line from Revenge of the Sith and came up with a few dozen different ways to phrase it. All robotically delivered with some of the worst acting I've ever seen from an Asylum movie, as well as some of the worst of all time. Most scenes were clearly done in one take. If the actor said the lines correctly, it was time to move on and flexion be damned which also results in vampires who are supposedly from the early 19th century suddenly mentioning that our hero has gone full slayer mode, and the director forgetting to yell cut, resulting in scenes where the actors stand around, smiling awkwardly, wondering what they're supposed to do next, which somehow also escaped the editing process. There's no chemistry, no human reaction, everyone just takes it at face value that there are vampires and our hero has been sent to kill them all, and they immediately sign up all while acting like they were just woken up in the middle of the night to read their kid a story they already read a million times that they just want to get through so they can get back to sleep. I got so bored just summarizing the movie, I went on an off-script rant about Baby Yoda right in the middle of the video. Anything to remind me that quality exists. Oh, but in case you actually wanted to hear what anyone was saying, they took care of that too. Nearly all dialogue and sound effects are set to the lowest possible volume level without outright muting the movie. I had to maximize the audio gain on my video editor just so I could strain to hear what anyone was saying. 
only to once again get blasted back when they threw in lines at it in post. I should not have to watch a movie with my finger permanently stuck on the volume knob. And the rest of the technicals suck as well. Choppy editing, white flash transitions, stock color filters over most of the movie, sped up footage, and overused sound effects, including the infamous Howie scream, used 100% unironically. I would be laughing at how cheesy and inept this movie is, if I wasn't reeling from the barrage of pointless commentary that this movie spews forth like verbal diarrhea. Oh, and the ending sucks too, setting up a sequel that… kinda happened, but we'll get to that when we get to that. But honestly, who cares? With characters flatter than the paper the script was scribbled on, incoherent and inaudible dialogue, and acting so poor you have to wonder if anyone was pulling a John Harper and intentionally trying to get the director's attention, this movie's hard enough to get through without the threat of a sequel. It says something when I have to spend a good chunk of the opening of the review apologizing to friggin' Vampires vs. Zombies for calling it the worst vampire movie ever. I'd say this movie bites, but with how annoying and tasteless it is, it's more the equivalent of being gummed to death. Just pass on by and leave this movie to rot on its eternal goodwill shelf. A fitting curse for such a sucky movie. Number 3. Alien Abduction. This is an ugly, ugly movie. On practically every conceivable level. Well, except maybe the plot, which, like I said before, isn't that bad. The idea of someone being kidnapped and sneaking around a mysterious military base, where aliens are held and doctors and officers carry out inhumane experiments on mentally challenged inmates, does hold promise, and, done correctly, would make a great Twilight Zone or Outer Limits or even Love, Death, and Robots episode, if it hasn't been already. Unfortunately, those are 20 to 45 minute long anthology segments, and this is an hour and a half long movie. So the plot that would fit perfectly with a shorter runtime has to be stretched past the point of audience interest, while having no other subplots of progression to support what easily becomes a monotonous journey throughout the same settings over and over again. I never felt like our lead was making progress, or learning anything new about her environment. Scenes will last just short of forever, as we're shown pretty much the same things over and over again. The cafeteria, the doctor's office, the sewers, the hallways, and about a million identical offices, where we learn pretty much nothing, until the movie shows pity and just straight up reveals what this place actually is. Maybe the movie planted subtle clues here and there that add to the end reveal, but with how scattered and featureless these locations appear, it's kinda hard to tell what we're even looking at. Oh hell, even before we're stuck in this place, the movie establishes how unbearable it'll be to sit through. The beginning scene itself, where we have to endure our idiot main cast, including one certain character who somehow manages to give a more annoying performance than any incarnation of Amy Rose, lasts over 20 minutes and could have been cut out without anyone noticing. In fact, if they just kept the prologue to the scattered flashbacks and the dream sequences the lead has throughout the movie, that would have added to the mystery of her journey and given the audience more of a puzzle to put together. But nope, it's just more padding to sit through. And of course, the writing and pacing is awful. At several points, the writer clearly wrote himself into a corner, so this doctor, who we're never given any backstory or explanation of, has to show up to bail our lead out. Just pops the hell right out of nowhere with something for her to take along for later reasons. How? Why? Never explained. He just shows up, clearly reads some lines off a cue card, then he's gone for another 15-20 minutes. Yeah, Dark City, this movie is not. But even if I cared about this character, nobody acting in this cares about their performances. All dialogue is flat and lifeless, like everyone only received their script five minutes before the director shouted action. It's not quite as bad as Way of the Vampire, but it somehow feels more depressing, like the actors clearly don't want to be here. Which, with how run down, moldy, and abandoned most of these filming locations look, I can't say I blame them. Hell, the line reads are so boring that the editor couldn't even be bothered to make sure each scene had audio, as shown in one of the most infamous clips from an Asylum movie. But even with the flat acting, lazy writing, monotonous plot, and terrible sound editing, including a stock soundtrack that fits the alien theme as much as the theme to the heights would fit Law & Order, we're still not at the worst part. No, the reason why this movie is on this list is just how disgusting and unpleasant it is to watch. This movie pulls no punches in making you feel uncomfortable. 
Whether it's people having their brains drilled out by a nurse with a hand mixer, alien worms bursting out of people's faces, a kid that ends up lobotomized, and even a doctor who jerks off an alien spraying jizz all over our lead. Because I totally needed Freddy Got Fingered flashbacks. And that's just the stuff done intentionally. Adding to the nausea are blurry filters, shaky cam from both the regular camera and the handheld our lead uses, annoying autofocus and still frames, unerotic and unneeded nudity, sound that is never balanced or consistent, and this glaring effect over both the opening credits and some alien faces that really hurt my eyes. None of it is done with any artistic or meaningful merit, nothing adds to the experience or comes back as a major plot point. The gore and other shock tactics are just here to make a hard to watch movie even harder to sit through. Anywhere you look, this movie is intent on making you sick to your stomach. So if you are forced to watch this thing, don't do it after all you can eat pizza. Oh, and there's a twist here as well. Again, I didn't give it away in the review, but at this point I don't care anymore. If you don't want it ruined, I'll just give you a minute to skip ahead and... Okay, here we go. It turns out that this military station is actually in space! And all the humans we saw, or at least our leads, her friends, and all the crazies, are clones! Presumably created as part of an upcoming invasion, but shockily shock, the movie's maddeningly vague in that detail as well. Our lead kills her original and lobotomized self, meaning they can't create any more clones of her, tricks the commander into thinking she's been successfully brainwashed, is sent back down to Earth with clones of her friends, and the movie ends. Yeah, that was totally worth it. Like having to wallow in a septic tank, then being tossed a single napkin to clean yourself off. Actually, I wish I did wallow in a septic tank instead of washing this. That disgust washes off. There are good elements here and there. Sometimes we'll get a passable performance from a couple of the actors, the cast is surprisingly eclectic, some hailing from some famous movies, the alien costumes and puppets have work put into them, and like I said, the story's really not that bad, and I'd love to see a better execution of it. But it's not worth sitting through the filth and incompetence that comprises the rest of this movie. This is one of the hardest things I've had to sit through. A disgusting experience, virtually unwatchable in every aspect. I can tell that there was some sign of effort, but completely misguided effort, as clearly nobody knew what they were doing. If you ever do make the mistake of watching this movie, you'd better hope for an alien abduction soon after, because any chance of having your memory wiped and forgetting you ever had to sit through this trek will be welcomed with open arms. Number 2. Frankenstein Reborn if you're gonna make some artistic, exploitive art film that challenges filmmaking and our perception of humanity and life in general, you'd better know what you're doing and have the talent to back it up. Otherwise, you'll come across as a whiny, immature, attention-desperate edgelord who thinks that sex, gore, and a complete lack of fun or joy is all a movie needs to be seen as brilliant. Which is how I see everyone behind the making of Frankenstein Reborn, a movie with no Frankenstein, no themes of rebirth, and where any relation to the original story doesn't pop up until the last 30 minutes. So why is it called Frankenstein Reborn? Because the makers were pretentious as fuck, and they thought that tying their movie to a literary classic would make their work seem just as important. And it's not. It's really not. While the story has themes of what it means to be human, whether a man is created to do good or evil, and the dangers of tampering in God's domain, this movie has no substance or story to speak of. Yeah, there is nothing. Absolutely no point to this movie or what it's trying to say or do. Say what you want about alien abduction, and I did, twice. There was a plot. Some sort of goal was established, an A to B journey with a mystery thrown in to solve. But this movie doesn't even have that. Hell, I can sum up the entire plot in one sentence. Our lead Victor tells a story in a mental institution about how he injected this one guy with microscopic robots to hopefully cure his paralysis, but they drive the guy mad so Victor kills him and turns him into a monster to hopefully make the nanites work, but the monster's now even more insane and tries to kill everyone before the doctor Victor was talking to kills both Victor and the monster. BAM! That's all that happens. Oh, and there's some stuff about a murder investigation and funding and lesbian sex, and it turns into John Carpenter's Halloween for a second. But none of it has any bearing on the plot or affects our characters any way, so who cares? This movie has so little going on, so much space to fill for an 80 minute plot, that it literally plays some scenes twice in a row. We literally get the same 20 minutes of footage right after seeing that 20 minutes of footage. That's how desperate it is to make feature length. 
That is the most pathetic editing trick I've ever seen, and really says something when a movie has to use itself as stock footage. Oh, but the movie wants you to think that things are going on, and that what it's showing is absolutely brilliant. We'll get scenes shot in dark shadows, deep filters, or overexposed lighting, and some desperate attempt to apply style to this movie. We'll get bright white flashes that don't even look finished to grab the audience's attention for a second. And, throughout the movie, we'll suddenly have still shots randomly inserted of what just happened. Like it's suddenly a crime drama. Or Run Lola Run. And, of course, we'll have sex and blood and gore and drug use and swearing because, in case you forgot, this movie's for adults! No, it's not. Mature elements are only mature when used in a mature way, with actually mature themes they can help support. When they're just spread around your movie with no context or story to back them up, you have the artistic integrity of a toddler wiping their finger paint over everything but the paper. But you're 35, so knock that shit off. If you're not going to tell a story appropriate to your audience's mental age, you have no business trying to be dark and mature. Especially when the characters you've written are completely unlikable human garbage, impossible to relate to or sympathize with. Victor is a complete psychopath, who, throughout the movie, steals his investors' money, performs unethical, untested experiments on subjects that trust him, roofies his assistants to participate in drugged-up threesomes, kills his patients and mutilates their corpses, orders his monster to kill and dissolves the bodies, then argues with and eventually tries to have his doctor killed. Which would be fine if there was some backstory or personality to flesh him out. Which there isn't! He's horrible because he's written to be horrible. And because he's horribly written. And horribly acted. Seriously, how did you manage to give Rhett Giles the worst performance of his life? Everyone else is also horrible, even more one note than Victor, and ultimately contribute next to nothing. Even the monster, despite an impressive makeup job, is just a regular monster, lacking the personality or complexity of the monster he's supposedly based on. In his very brief screen time, he kills people, tries to kill Victor, decides, nah, helps Victor kill people, then decides to kill Victor again. And that's it. I'm sorry, what are we supposed to learn from any of this? What is the ultimate goal here? What is this movie trying to say? That being terrible people leads to terrible things? That resurrecting a guy who wants to kill you will result in a monster who also wants to kill you? Oh, is that all? Well, my eyes have been opened. I've seen the light. This is the most profound thing I've ever heard, and I've truly been reborn. Oh no, wait, I'm still the same grumpy bastard who's tired of so-called auteurs that think that they're being edgy and insightful by preaching the same bullshit every 14-year-old whines about on their blog. The life is pain, hope is meaningless, and we die for nothing. Feel bad that you exist. Well, thank you for taking 80 minutes for saying what South Park said in five seconds. Life is pain. Life is only pain. This movie is insanely bad. Unbelievably awful. While I said Alien Abduction was a chore to get through because of just how ugly an experience it was, this movie is... also very ugly to look at, but it's also completely tasteless. There's no joy, no likability, nothing about it that will make me want to willingly watch it to the end. If I didn't have to watch it as part of this look through the asylum, I would have smashed the disc within the first 10 minutes. This is one of the most soul-crushing experiences I've ever had to go through. One that made me literally question what I was doing with my life. You nearly put an end to this retrospective, both out of a feeling that I'd never be happy again after seeing this, and out of fear that I'd ever see its kind again. But the knowledge that I'd never see a movie as soul-sucking as this managed to get me back on track, and destroying the DVD at the end of that review was the best therapy I've ever had in my life. Lay Scott, I don't know where your head was when you wrote and directed this, but I'm glad you pulled it out of that deep dark crevice for your later work. I think, in a way, that was the true rebirth this movie promised us. And that was only the second position on this list. What could possibly be worse than a movie that nearly ended this look at the Asylum's work? Well, if you've been following this retrospective, you probably have an idea. But if you don't, we'll get to it in two shakes of the Beast of Bray Road's tail. But first, a few dishonorable mentions. Wildflower, a completely unsexy erotic thriller with some of the worst framing and scene structure I've seen so far. Almost made the list, but the acting's pretty good, there's a legitimate mystery and twist ending, Asylum mascot Kim Little has probably the best performance of her life, and the fact that it's shot like a daytime soap opera forgives some of the more overdramatic elements. Still not something I'd recommend, but it scraped together just enough good to miss this list. Killers 2. 
Like I said, this was in competition with Evil Eyes for this list. It's a boring psychological thriller that basically repeats the same thing every 15 minutes, reveals the twist in the first third, and devolves into the first movie at the end, just without any of the suspense, subtlety, or artistic themes the first movie had. However, the acting is good, the camera is wonderful, the effects are surprisingly competent and fit the nightmarish nature of this movie, and Heather's Beast Mode brings a new element to her character. Still, it doesn't add to anything established in the first movie, nor does it really lead up to a payoff, so even if you like the first one, I can't bring myself to recommend this. Shapeshifter. Probably should have been on this list, but Scarecrow Slayer pissed me off a little bit more. Still, talk about one of the biggest letdowns a movie with that title could give. There's no reason for there to be a shapeshifter, the pacing is wretchedly slow, the acting is more wooden than a forest of petrified trees, and someone please keep David Michael Ladd away from the editing computer unless he's doing his own personal projects. Still, the thing about being completely forgettable is that I've already forgotten this movie exists. As will you, as soon as I finish this sentence. King of the Ants, another pretentious pet project, but one where I could tell the people behind it knew what they were doing. Just the end product didn't really meet expectations. I hesitate to list this among the worst of the Asylum's catalog, or even the same sentence, since it is the most movie-like of their movies so far. It doesn't even feel like an Asylum movie, with an all-star cast, notable names behind the production, professional scene and sound editing, and a revenge plot that breaks from the cookie-cutter slasher script most other Asylum movies fall back on. I don't like it, but I do appreciate the effort that went into it. Vampires vs. Zombies This would have made the list, but as I stated before, I'm only counting movies actually produced by the Asylum. However, even if it was here, it would probably only rank at 9 or 10. Yes, it's a terrible movie with terrible pacing, blurry camera work, and hilariously cheap practical effects, but compared to the other titles I've had to watch, there is an element of so bad it's good. I can tell at least a couple people behind this movie had fun making it, which is more than can be said for most of the other movies on this list. And finally, Killers. If I was anyone else, this would have made the list just for how dark and impossible to see it is. But I can't bring myself to hate this movie. It has legitimate suspense, great acting from its cast, and an arc for one of its characters that's tied in with the situation and the movie's contrast. Maybe the DVD version looks better, and I'll probably have to check once I find an affordable copy. But even with the movie's lack of lighting, it's a title I don't regret seeing, and one that I recommend. And with that, let's finish off this list with my final pick. And the number one worst classic Asylum movie is... The Surge. Some may be surprised to see this movie at the top of the list. Really? A movie about high schoolers developing superpowers is a worse movie than one where people's brains are drilled out by a hand blender, or where a scientist drugs and rapes his assistants? Yes, and for a very good reason. On the off chance you actually wanted to watch any of the previous movies listed, whether for research or you're just completely insane, you can. For, despite all the other major, MAJOR flaws any of them had, at least they're viewable. Even with the ones filmed with shaky handhelds, at least the camera stays still long enough to make out what's on screen, and most of them have the characters in frame as they're doing things. So while there's nothing worthwhile going on for the most part, and some are truly unwatchable due to the content, you can still put them in, sit your butt down, and watch them with little to no chance of motion sickness. Not the case with this particular movie! A film that, in my personal opinion, has the absolute worst camera and technical work I've ever seen in any movie ever. The funny thing is, the camera starts out competent, and even impressive in some spots, but as the movie plays, we'll get scenes where the camera loses track of the characters it's supposed to follow, quickly adjusting and making the shot a blurry mess, plus shots with very awkward claustrophobic framing, where the camera alternates between being held by somebody 2 feet tall looking up and 8 feet tall looking down. Sometimes the camera is so needlessly zoomed in, it'll lose sight of characters supposed to be in the shot, as both they and the operator desperately try to adjust themselves to get everyone in view. And some shots are filmed at 45 degree Dutch angles, for literally no reason. Like they had to film some last minute scenes with the camera crew behind the live action Grinch movie. Oh, but if you thought it couldn't look any worse, well, that was just the beginning. Literally, because halfway through, the camera suddenly starts swaying side to side like the camera crew boarded one of those Viking ship rides and forgot to turn off the equipment. There is literally no reason for this. Just most of the scenes are now filmed like the camera is sitting sideways on a swing. It is one of the most sickening viewing experiences I've ever had. 
One with no purpose, no artistic meaning, just a camera constantly moving left to right. Like the operator was bored and absentmindedly rocking the camera and nobody told them to knock it off. At least when I complained about the other movies making me sick, it was because of content actually on screen. Stuff that I could just tune out if I tried hard enough. But having to watch most of a movie where the camera lurches in either direction or positions itself at such a disorienting angle, it's like being stuck on one of those gyroscope rides that violently swirls you around before coming to an abrupt halt in some awkward position so you don't know which way is up. Right before suddenly spinning again. For over an hour. And you can't get off. And if I'm making you sick just from these descriptions, imagine what it felt like for me to watch it all the way through. For an hour 40 minutes, the longest runtime for an asylum movie by this point. I'm getting waves of nausea just from remembering this movie exists. And of course, the rest of the movie is awful as well. At best, it's a cheap ripoff of The Craft, but with everything that made that movie fun and over the top, either dropped or exploited past the audience's breaking point. The story is overly basic and even despicable. Some teenagers are bullied by everyone at school, they discover they have superpowers, then they become the bullies for the rest of the movie. That's literally it? The plotting is slow and disjointed, scenes occurring with no connective tissue or impact, many of them reiterating the same points over and over, just going on short of forever. The scene editing is embarrassingly amateur, looking like it was put together in Windows Movie Maker, with random speed ups and slowdowns and stock transitions and camera tricks placed in shots obviously not set up for these effects. It's why I'm so hard on white transitions, I'm still suffering from PTSD from the ones in this movie. Ow! 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 The characters are despicable. They're obnoxious tokens either getting picked on by a school completely comprised of one-dimensional sadistic bullies and staff, or they're the ones hurting them, because the moral is that power is there to inflict pain on others. The acting is okay. It's CW teen drama acting, but it's at least given life and emotion, which is more than can be said for most of these movies. But then there's the audio editing, which, like the camera, is the worst I've ever heard from the asylum. It's always inconsistent. Some scenes sound like they're recorded in a studio and some on location, with very obvious fluctuations in clarity. Sometimes we'll even have two people talking in a room, one sounding like they're actually there, only for the next person to obviously sound like they're in a closed off recording booth. And when they do have to dub speech in, it almost never matches their lips, which is probably why there are so many awkwardly framed or cropped scenes where you can't see the actors' mouths moving. Sometimes I don't even think they got the original actor back for their lines, and we'll have a 45-year-old woman dubbing for someone in their early 20s. And then, just like Alien Abduction, the ultimate editing flub, where they forgot to include the dialogue for an entire shot. There's no excuse. If you produce a movie and your editor forgot to include audio for people having a discussion and it's on the shelves before anyone can fix it, then just take your editor out back and shoot them. Then shoot yourself for not bothering to check on the movie you supposedly financed. And finally, what's up with these lights that randomly pop up in some shots? They look like the director was jangling his keys in front of one of the lights and nobody had the guts to tell him to cut it out. Or maybe it was a subtle nudge to see if the camera person was paying attention and someone would order a retake. Didn't work, so now it's just another source of disorientation, further necessitating the need for a puke pail. I hope I've made it perfectly clear why this movie is at the top spot. There is not one single aspect of this movie I can call professional. The plot, the story, the editing, the audio, the lighting, all awful. Amateur at best, but most of the time hopelessly inexperienced. But yes, the top reason is the camera. The absolute worst I've ever seen. Its camera work so bad and so nauseating to look at, it might even be hazardous to watch. If you suffer from epilepsy or severe motion sickness, I strongly suggest staying away from this movie. Of course, I recommend everyone stay away from this movie, but especially anyone where watching this movie may prove fatal. Even I, who can stomach shaky cam and found footage movies just fine, still feels sick just thinking about how much this movie moves around. And it is for that reason, and all the other reasons I gave, that I, without hesitation, dub this the worst Asylum movie ever made. Let us hope we never see the like of this, or any of the other movies on this list, ever again. And with that, we can finally close the book on the early days of the Asylum.
I can tell it was tough for the studio to finally find its niche, but it was fascinating to see the stops along the way. Whether they were good, bad, or really bad, it was still fun to see the variety of titles and genres they experimented with, before finally finding their true calling. Now that they know they are meant for mockbusters, it's time to open up a new chapter in the studio's history, and to see what ideas they came up with for making movies that were kinda sorted like that blockbuster that's currently in theaters, which just so happened to be sitting on the shelves at Blockbuster at the same time. But what would be their next venture into this realm? If War of the Worlds proved so profitable to rip off, then what other guaranteed money maker could they copy to try to repeat their success? It would have to be something recognizable, something made by a well-known producer with an all-star cast, and preferably a remake of something that audiences would recognize and want to throw money at. In fact, why stop at it just being a big production? Why not base the next project on a movie whose subject just so happens to also be giant? Maybe even... king-sized? Yep, tune in next time to see what their take on a story about a 50-foot gorilla turned out to be, and if an ape is even included in the movie. Hey there everyone, thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please consider supporting me on Patreon and help me create even more content like this. It's only a dollar to get early access to my videos, and only five dollars gets you a credit at the end of each of those videos, with higher tiers offering these and even more perks. And as you help me reach certain goals, I have super special content lined up for all of you. Head on over and check out my Patreon today, and I'll see you next time.